okay guys, so this is Britannia Beach. This is the mining museum's coming up. Britannia Beach. This is actually a little town, I guess, if we'll call that. For about 10 minutes, 15 minutes outside of Swamish here. It costs us $80 for two people. It's $39. And then you know you have to have some kind of mini rates basically. 80 some bucks to do this. Good old BC day. The mountains in the rain. Well we are in the rainforest, I guess, so it makes sense. So it was predominantly a copper mine, but then they found gold and lead and silver and various other metals that you usually find with gold. Conveyor shed. We use the train to take us from where we are right now to the spot in the tunnel where we're gonna get off and continue on foot. Once we're off the train, we're not gonna get back on. Are we all ready? Yeah. All right, let's go. take one moment before we officially start our tour to very gratefully recognize that we're going to be doing all of our exploring and learning on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Squamish Nation. So first things first, we are inside an old copper mine. Now this mine officially operated for about 70 years, from 1905 to 1974. Now, although those are our years of official operation, we actually first discovered that there was copper inside this mountain in 1888. Now, unfortunately, because of how this mountain was formed, we were never lucky enough to find pure copper here. We never dug up chunks of that reddish orange metal. Instead, we found a mineral that has the metal hidden inside. And that mineral is called calcopyrite. I have a pretty good example of it right here. Hopefully with the help of my flashlight, you can see that beautiful, shiny, golden color. That is our mineral. So that is the calcopyrite that our miners were searching for all day, every day. Now, unfortunately for the workers here, because we were finding our metal in its mineral form, our mining process had to have two major steps. The first is inside the mountain. We need to find this mineral, we need to build the tunnel so we can get to it and get it out of the mountain. But then everything is still trapped together. It's still just a mineral. So we go to step number two, and that's in the mill building. That's where we're gonna smash everything apart and go and put it through some processes so that we can separate out the copper and sell that. So first things first, exploration. How do we find what we're looking for? Well, unfortunately, if you were here working at the very beginning, the late 1800s, and you were on this exploration team, you unfortunately had to do everything by hand. This basically meant we hired a bunch of guys and we sent them walking all over the mountain. Anytime they saw this beautiful golden color on the surface, they'd mark it and that's where we'd dig. Luckily for us, around 1908, a very important machine arrived here and it helped us take a really big step forward in that exploration process. This super important machine is the one I have right here. This is an early version of a diamond drill. Now these are what we call core samples. At the very, in the very beginning of using this machine, in the early 1900s, after 1908 when this arrived, we used these in a very basic way. So let's use this tunnel as an example. We've built the tunnel this far, 
and we haven't found anything yet. So we bring in, bring in the diamond drill and we collect some core samples from that area down there. We pull them out and we just take a look. Uh-oh, the samples in my hand right now are really boring. They don't have any of this beautiful, shiny, golden mineral. So that's of course telling us, abandon this section. This is a huge waste of our time and our money. So we try it again and again and again until eventually we pull out core samples that have some of that golden mineral inside. Now, if you worked inside the mine, you always worked an eight hour shift. You were never allowed to spend more time than that in the underground. It was considered a safety issue. But the mine wanted to work 24 seven. So we had three shifts of eight hours each. Well, surprisingly, tunnel making was actually really simple. It required three very basic steps that we would repeat over and over and over again. So step number one, we're gonna drill. Step number two is the powerhouse in our project, it's the explosion. We are gonna pack the explosives into those holes so that when the explosion goes off and all that force shoots outward, it'll shatter the rock wall. Now, although the powerhouse is very important, it's critical to what we're doing, it's also incredibly dangerous and it's going to make a giant mess. So that unfortunately means that step number three is clean up the mess. Pick up all the rock we just created, get it out of the way, and then bring the drills back in and do the whole process again. This is our hand drill. This is what they would have been using in the late 1800s. Now it's got two main parts. This part over here is our drill steel. And of course, this part is a hammer. The way it works is you take the drill steel and you put the big end up against the rock, like so. And then we hit the other end with the hammer. Now luckily for our miners, as time went on, technology advanced and we brought in mechanical drills. The very first mechanical drill that was ever used here is this really big one down here at the end. This machine is called the piston drill. Now this would have shown up here around 1905. It is very big, very powerful. So a huge step forward when compared to our hand drill. It weighs 350 pounds. This means it took two to three men to move and operate it because it had to be carried everywhere. It's also standing on three legs. This unfortunately means it's actually not super stable. And there were instances where this machine would start to wobble and then could collapse to one side or the other, potentially landing on someone. And last but not least, this machine creates a ton of dust. And all of that dust is shot straight up into the air. And as time went on, our miners are breathing it in and they start to develop infections in their lungs. Here we called it silicosis, but it is very similar to what coal miners would call black lung. Unfortunately, it took around 25 years for a better, safer drill to arrive. This is my jack leg drill. These drills would have shown up here around 1930. As soon as they arrived, they very quickly became the favorite of our miners for a few different reasons. One, it's a lot smaller. Only weighs about 100 pounds, so it's much easier for one person to move and operate on their own. Another reason is this really cool hydraulic leg. Although it might seem weird that one leg is better than three, this one uh, offers a lot of stability and it actually makes the machine quite easy to use. And last but definitely not least, this was one of our first wet drills, meaning that we attach a water hose to the machine, the water flows through the inside and it gets sprayed at the end of the drill bit. Water and dust make mud. Now that mud is gonna float all over the ground. It's gonna make the area very gooky. It's all over our pants and shoes. It made our miners very dirty, very wet, and honestly, pretty grumpy. Uh, if you were assigned to use this in your average eight hour shift, you'd be expected to make about 16 drill holes. Those are gonna range from three to four feet deep. You are gonna pack around 50 pounds of dynamite into your 16 drill holes. Once it's all packed in, you're done. You get on the train and you go home. That is the end of your shift. The blasting crew is going to come in behind you. They're a little more specialized. They're going to insert the blasting caps and attach the fuses to the blasting box. That way, at the absolute very end of our eight-hour shift, when everyone is out of the tunnel, kaboom, we set off the explosion. Um, all right, so welcome to our second chamber. This is an area of our tunnel that we like to call the muck chamber. And that's because that nice big pile of rock down there is called muck. Now, if you were one of our workers here and you were assigned to clean that up, you would be given the nickname of Mucker. These were the guys who were less experienced, and so of course they got the bad job. You could be expected to move anywhere between 6 and 16 tons of rock during your shift. That is absolutely bonkers. That's around the weight of two elephants. This, of course, is going to take a long time, and as you get tired, you get sloppy, it's really easy for you to injure yourself or someone else. You're literally throwing rock over your own head. Now, the first version of a muck machine 
showed up in the 1920s. And around World War II, early 1940s, they landed on a design that looks like this one. Luckily for us, my muff machine does still work. So I'm gonna turn it on and show you how it operates. All right, here comes our compressed air. Three, two, one. <laughs> Now once this ore cart is totally full with the rock, we're going to detach it from the machine and we send it out on the train tracks. Today we've got awesome overhead electric lights. Our miners didn't have this. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to turn these lights out and I'm going to show you the lights they did use. Alright, here we go. On the count of three, it's just going to get dark. One, two, three. Alright, there we go. This is what our tunnels are like with no light at all to help us out. This is absolutely ridiculous. No one can do anything safely. And luckily our miners did realize that. This is why they always brought their lights with them. Our very first company issued light. There we go. And a candle. We used candles for the first 15 years that we were operating here at Britannia. Now I'm sure you can imagine there are some flaws with this system. For one, a candle does not last eight hours. That's how long our shift is. I have work to do. I need to be able to set this down and have it stay lit. Eventually, we came up with some pretty cool candle holders like the one I have here. Set my candle inside. It's got a hook on one side, but more importantly, it's got a nice long spike on one end. This means that when I get to my workstation, I can drill a hole in the wall and then set it inside. Just like that. This next light that I'm gonna show you is called a carbide lamp. These showed up here around 1920, and they ran using a chemical reaction. So we take just a little bit of regular water and pour it inside. That water is going to drip down into the second section where it comes into contact with the calcium carbide. Those two things mix together, and they create acetylene gas. Some of you might know we use it in welding torches today. There we go. I had to let the gas build up a little bit more. So here we see we get a nice bright flame from our, our gas. This is uh, more stable and generally more reliable than the candles. Not to mention we do have this reflective disc. This gives our miners the ability to direct the light where they want it to go. As time went on, the government actually recognized this is not very safe and they made it illegal to use any type of open flame in the underground. Now that is a great decision for safety, but what are we gonna use now? Luckily for us, around the same time, another type of light Becoming very popular. This is an early version of a battery operated headlamp. This part over here is an acid lead battery, it weighs about nine pounds. The men were told to run their belt through the little loops here so it could sit on their waist, run the wire up their back, and clip the light to the front of their hard hat. By 1958, everyone had been assigned a battery operated headlamp, and that was the last type of light that we used here right up until 1974 when the mine shut down. All right, everyone. Now that we are safely above ground again, we do have one more very important job. We got to set off our shift whistle. So for example, one whistle means shift is over, everyone's out. Three whistles means something bad happened. There has been an accident. We need first aid, we need search and rescue. However, if something bad was happening above ground and you needed the underground to evacuate because you need all those men to help, let's say, fight a fire, the whistle didn't work. You can't hear it when you're deep within the underground. <laughs> they would toss a sulfur mixture into the ventilation system. This would make the entire underground stink like rotten eggs. This was a signal to absolutely everyone, get out and get out now. For a long time, this community was very isolated. They had to rely on each other. And so when bad things happened, you needed to call on any of the workers who were available. Now, luckily for us, we do not follow the stink bomb system today, but we do still use the whistle in an official capacity. So I'm going to sound this once now to let everyone know that we are safely out of the tunnel. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. These are the core sheds, all the core samples. Mill number three. So this is where they process all that ore. or a calcium. Okay, so we finished the tour now. Um, we're just gonna take a little walk quickly, look at some stuff, because it's pretty rainy, so I don't wanna get too wet, but I'll do it quickly for you guys. That was the core sample shut up there, right? I walked past it, showed you guys that. The pipe and welding shop. 
Obviously for maintenance, what engine we got here, really nice little Caterpillar. Nice, good engine, sweet, okay. Moving on, it's really wet guys. So excuse me if I make this brief. We got a lime tank. All part of the chemical processing. More equipment. Copper sulfate over there. Oh, machine shop. Explosives car. Oh, the aerial tramways. We've seen a lot of those. Aerial tramway bucket. Various lumpy machines. Ambulance car. That's fascinating. Give you an incentive not to get hurt. You don't transport that thing. These are the trains, the mining trains, the ore trains, transport people. Muck and muscle. Yeah, no kidding. So that was the engine that we took. See buddy there in action. Man car. So this is how they would have gotten to work. Bench grinders, drill presses, saws. Very, very wet, very wet. Britannia mine, copper sulfate. Zinc was mined. Yep, so they started to try and mine copper. And then after World War II, when it became the price of copper dropped out, they started mining zinc. And then ironically, they needed copper sulfate to help mine the zinc from the sphalerite. The conveyor shed, the lead plant, do not enter. Oh, this is all the culture. It was a town, as much as, much as it was a mine, it was a town. We got a dumpy level or a builder's level here. We got a phone, blasting machine, plunger, chemistry set, right, for isolating the minerals, CO2 detector, and then this is the actual mine, full scale, the track for dumping the ore, the processing mill, the powerhouse, the aerial tramway, no physical aspects of mill number one remain. So you can see the progression over time. Mill two, so this was mill two, and then this is mill three. So you can see how it's gradually adapted over time. And then this is the old map. All the camps. Okay, so that's the mining truck. So let's give you an idea of the size. Look at the size of these tires, eh? The not small truck there. Look at the size of these rims, man. And these tires. So it's seen better days, though. Just absolute monstrosity. I guess that's kind of the point, though. But really cool looking truck. See these diffs? Let's check these diffs out. Ooh, that's a big axle. Size of these tires, man. 